Let me just start the recording. Okay, welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining this webinar today. Uh, the webinar is part of the Twinning Spring Campaign 2023 and the focus for today is the school as a place to address pressing issues in the digital age, tackling disinformation and promoting digital literacy. Before we officially start, I would like to invite all of you to take part in the campaign and join the group to discover all the wonderful activities we have prepared for you. Here you can find the link. It will be immediately available after the webinar. So please now pay attention to our presentation and then after the webinar, you will be able to access this group, this group and discover all the activities and the other upcoming events that we have as part of the spring campaign 2023. So the webinar today will explore how education can empower young people to make informed choices in our digital age. It will focus on building resilience towards this information and promoting digital literacy in primary and secondary education. The session will present the guidelines for teachers and educators on tackling this information and promoting digital literacy through education that the Commission published last October as part of the Digital Education Action Plan. Speakers today include representatives from both the Commission and the expert group which developed the guidelines. That's why we are here today and I'm very, very happy to introduce our two guest speakers, Simona from the Directorate General of the Education, Youth, Sport and Culture of the European Commission, part of Unit Digital Education, which is in charge of the implementation of the Digital Education Action Plan 2021-2027. And we have also here with us Kari Kivinen, the Education Outreach Expert of the AU IPO Observatory, led the Intellectual Property in Education Project and Network, which promotes creativity, innovation, entrepreneurship, and responsible digital engagement among young Europeans. He was also a member of the Commission Expert Group on tackling disinformation and promoting digital literacy through education and training. But without further ado, Please, Simona, I would like to invite you on our virtual stage today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marta. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really a great pleasure to be here with you today and to discuss uh, the school really as the place to address pressing issues in the digital age, in particular tackling disinformation and promoting digital literacy. Uh, on my side, I will present you the guidelines from the side of the Commission and then Kari will take over and walk you through some very practical examples uh, in the guidelines, but also beyond that you can use in your work with your students. You are all uh, experts or at least interested in disinformation, uh, tackling, addressing disinformation uh, and promoting digital literacy. But before we go into the actually the guidelines, I would like to start with a short icebreaker to provoke you to test your knowledge and your understanding of what it means, what, digit, what, what information is actually uh, genuine and what is uh, misleading information or disinformation. So I invite you now to go either to Slido uh, and reply there, or you can also put your uh, replies in the chat. So we'll have three very brief questions just to, to get you into, let's say, the spirit, the mood on the topic before we deep dive into more the theory and the practice. So I uh, hope that you are all either on Slido or you, have, uh, you are ready to put your replies in the chat on the first question. And the first question is, how much faster do fake news spread online in comparison to true, uh, true news or truthful information? Six times faster, 15 times faster, or two times faster or twice as fast? So please write your guess, a wild guess, or maybe you know in the chat or, or the sli on Slido as well. Uh, 
so what do you think is the correct answer? How much faster do fake news spread online in comparison to truthful news? Six times, 15 times or two times? So, come on, I don't, okay. Voting is closed, but can people okay. write in the chat? I will try to open it again, but okay. yeah, exactly. Indeed, you can Put type in the, the answer in the chat so we can exactly. read it immediately from there. Yes, indeed. So the question stays the same and I really invite you if it's easier to use the chat, you should be able to type directly what your views are. How much faster do fake news spread online in comparison to true news? Six times, 15 times or two times faster. OK, we have six, we have 15, we have six again. Any further? Six, yes, okay. Well, very convincingly, six times faster, it seems to be for our participants. I have a couple of guesses of 15, I see. Okay, so it's six times again. Uh, I don't see anybody going for two times faster. That's interesting. Okay, six, six again. Um, okay, my proposal is to reveal the, the reply so we can proceed also to the other questions. And actually, you were really right. The majority of you, it's six times faster. Apparently, in uh, 2018, the Massachusetts Institute of Innovation and Technology or the MIT identified that fake news spread six times faster on Twitter in comparison to truthful news. And not for not only this, but actually those news are 70% more likely to be retweeted in comparison to news that are truthful in their nature. So very well done on the first question we have. Let's go to the second one. The second question is, in your opinion, is this post true or fake? We look at the post in its entirety. We have what is the title here. The title is police had to shut down a 3000 person game of hide and seek in Ikea. This is a Facebook post from what we can see. And we have a very simple picture of Ikea. So in your opinion, by looking at this excerpt, is this fake or it's truthful news? Please again use the chat or Slido. I think on the chat is going to be fairly easy uh fairly easier also for you to to reply so is this fake is this post true or fake okay we have fake 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 very convincingly fake okay nobody thinks that's true everybody thinks that's fake it's okay, one person, Ana Carolina Pinto Emelo says that it's true. Well, a couple of more seconds for any last minute suggestions from, from you here in the chat or on Slido, fake, fake, fake. Well, very predominantly then um, uh, your opinions are that this is fake. Well, I am sorry to disappoint you, but this is actually truthful news. It's real news. What happened is that in, that in 2000 and um, let me double check my 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 year here 2019 in Glasgow in Scotland there was a Facebook event that was organized to play hide and seek in IKEA and more than 3000 people registered to for this Facebook event however what happened is that actually IKEA staff spotted this Facebook event and since hide and seek was already forbidden in IKEA a few years before that they signaled to the police and the police had to cancel the Facebook event and the overall initiative. So actually, this is real information. This is a truthful piece of news, even though it sounds a little bit uh, surreal, if you ask me. So let's go quickly to the third question. This is a specific headline, and the headline says, people swallow eight spiders a year while they sleep. So again, the question here, the game here is very much the same. Is this new headline and news respectively true or fake again please put it in the chat what you think if it's truthful or if it's fake news people swallow eight spiders a year while they sleep what do you think it might it sounds pretty scary actually if you ask me so uh but i don't want to to 
to make your uh, to provide bias to your replies. So we have a couple of replies. Fake, fake, fake again. OK, let's wait for a few more ideas. We have one person, Frosina, says that it's true. We have a few other people saying fake. Any last minute ideas here in the chat or in Slido? True. We have a couple of people who think that it's true. Fake. OK, last five seconds for last minute replies. OK, one more fake. One more true. OK, this is one. This one is quite um, close on both sides. We don't have a very strong winner in your replies. But the truth is that this is a fake piece of news. Thankfully, people do not swallow eight spiders while they sleep per ear. In fact, while we sleep, we obviously breathe. Our heartbeat as well creates vibrations and that, that you, some people might even snore. And this, these vibrations actually uh, put off the spiders and any type of insects to go near us. So the chances of us swallowing a spider while we sleep are very, very low if they're at all. Scientists say that maybe it can happen to swallow one in your lifetime, but this is not really the, the usual uh, situation for people. So thankfully, this last piece was a fake news. So with this, I suggest we we uh, we close the first the icebreaker. Thanks a lot for everybody who participated and shared their views. I hope you are now in the mood for the topics that we're going to discuss uh, later today and actually now in the next one hour and in particular how we can promote digital literacy and uh, fight disinformation through education and training and specifically i will present to you the guidelines for teachers and educators which the the commission with the strong support of expert group developed last year and published in October as part of the Digital Education Action Plan. The Digital Education Action Plan is the main EU policy strategy and plan as it is with a number of initiatives for digital transformation in education and training in Europe and beyond. So why? Why did we work on this? Um, on these guidelines? Well, the need is very clear and we see it very much from the evidence. Nowadays, we live in times when fake news, disinformation are more widespread than probably ever. And actually, eight in 10 Europeans think that the presence of fake news online is a threat for our democracy and for their countries as well. At the same time, young people believe that topics uh, uh, competences such as critical thinking, media literacy, democracy uh, as topics are not taught, taught enough at school. So there's a lot of space for the school and for the for the education to really tackle these issues and discuss them with the, with the students. At the same time, the levels of digital skills and competences we see across Europe are not satisfactory. They're not measuring to, to what is needed to be active digital uh, citizen in the digital age and also to be active on the labor market. So, for instance, we see that one third of the eighth graders are underperforming in digital skills. And at the same time, the latest PISA results show that only half of a little bit more than half of the 15 year olds in Europe have been taught to uh, to detect when information is subjective or biased, which is obviously absolutely essential for the development of their critical thinking, critical engagement with information and identifying disinformation. And at European level, the Commission, we strongly believe that education and training has a really key role to play in addressing these gaps and really supporting young people and the teachers in this journey. A very quick uh, slide for you to see that these guidelines are not the only initiative we have at European level when it comes to the promotion of digital literacy among young people and addressing this information. Instead, these efforts are very well rooted in with everything else we do. We have Erasmus+, Plus, we have the European Solidarity Corp as very important funding streams. Uh, you as e-twinning teachers, you're very well aware that a few years ago, uh, exactly in 2021, the annual team was media literacy and disinformation. So a lot of effort has been put on that side. The digital competences framework was updated last year to include also more examples of fake news and disinformation, only stressing how important these skills are to be digitally competent in the 21st century. At the same time, skills development and um, 
Support in capacity building is important. It's very, very important, but not the only instrument uh, we have. Uh, that's why there's a number of initiatives that promote safer online experiences for young people online. And this comes from the legislative uh, areas and uh, files of the Commission, such as the Digital Services Act, but also when it comes to self-regulation, co-regulation through codes of practices or even strategies about safer experiences for young people people online. So the guidelines in particular, what, what are we talking about here? This document, and I have the printed copy in my hands here. I hope you can see it. It's really a practical, very hands-on document for teachers and educators in primary and secondary level of education. As I said, our target group is teachers and educators, but the guidelines are very useful also for the broader uh, education and training community, such as um, school staff, psychologists, social workers, but also parents, media professionals, civil society. The idea is really to support the overall system in the development of, the, of these skills and ensuring that young people are confident, constructive, knowledgeable and critical with their interaction with the online world. The guidelines have a number of objectives and the first one is really to provide insights and useful information about the dynamics of this information as well as its different characteristics Statistics, what it means to be digitally literate and how this can be achieved, how information, uh, how digital tools can be used critically and responsibly, and how at the end of the day these skills and competences can be assessed by, uh, by teachers uh, when it comes to their students. And in this journey, in the development of the guidelines, the Commission was very pleased to be actually accompanied and to really have the expertise of a dedicated expert group. You will hear from one of the members later uh, after I finish my presentation. But what we did is we leveraged the really the rich experience there is on the topics and we put together an uh, expert group of really excellent and really distinguished um, experts in the field coming from academia, teacher training, civil society, the private sector in terms of uh, broadcasters, in terms of also technology providers, but also a number of international organizations uh, in, uh, that are active in the field, the OECD, the Council of Europe, your IPO, UNESCO as well. And this group was really the pen holder and really the, the driving force in the development of these guidelines that we're talking about today. The timeline was very, very short, one year from the beginning of the work of the expert group until the final deliverable. Kari can tell you how intense that was. What I would really like to highlight here is that we run a number of consultation activities in this process that included teachers in the context of the e-twinning annual conference in 2021. We also had a dedicated survey for teachers. We consulted young people, ministries of education to really understand how the guidelines can bring value. What are the main challenges that teachers are facing as well as young people or ministries and how the guidelines can be really of help for, for this community. Importantly, the guidelines were also um, are accompanied by a report which provides further academic and background information on the topics. The guidelines as a deliverable include uh, have five key chapters and here I would highlight to you the main uh, the main elements of each chapter. So we start with definitions. Definitions are very important. You will tell us hopefully in the Q&A but what we hear from teachers is that the the, the online sphere and uh, it's so, so dynamic that sometimes it's a bit difficult to really understand the concepts, the definitions, what it means to be digitally literate, what it means, this information, what, how it's different from misinformation, malinformation. And this chapter really sets the scene very clearly with a number of definitions that you can use directly in the classroom as part of the use of the, the guidelines. So here you have two examples, but also there's a number of other uh, definitions and terminology and terms that you can use uh, in your work directly. A few examples, algorithms, verification, deep fakes, pre-bunking, debunking, fact-checking. The guidelines provide a definition of all of these terms. Uh, 
Then they did dive into setting the scene. So how to ensure the classroom, the school and the broader community is really supporting the development of digital literacy and addressing this information. And the guidelines provide a number of ideas of what to do before the classes, during the classes and after the class activities. So for instance, uh, the, ex the guidelines suggest to already see what is out there, what are the different projects that have been developed at European, at national level, for example, where you as a teachers can already tap into or build your work on to look for other uh, uh, peers in working in the topic or other communities. E-twinning obviously is the, is the natural choice for you, but also to look into building trust in the classroom when it comes to tackling this information and discussing digital literacy. These are topics that are quite sensitive, emotional for some students, so it's important to build the trust and even to have one-to-one -one interaction with some students that you see are a little bit more, uh, need a bit of more uh, help or support in on the topic. During the activities, the importance, important element is to strike a balance between an open classroom and a safe space to monitor the emotional reactions, to monitor the overall temperature and then to check in with individual students if needed and then after activities it's very important not to leave this as a one-off class in the term it's important to build on the discussed to share your experience with peers to to also gather feedback to debrief and really to integrate the development of those skills and competences in the long term in your work Second chapter looks into uh, what it means to be digitally literate for when it comes to young people and actually not literate only, but what it means to be a digital citizen in 21st century. This chapter would help you to recognize low levels of digital literacy and to how it's different from technical competences. We often say, oh, young people are digital natives, they do so well with social media or browsing online, but actually are they so good in identifying deep fakes or uh, cheap fakes from real videos on TikTok? I don't know. I don't think we all of them are doing so well in that. So in that sense, this chapter would help you to, to differentiate these different levels. It would give you ideas of how to start teaching digital literacy. It's important to say these guidelines are not for teachers who are uh, I mean, they are available, but not only for teachers who are dealing with digital skills or IT or are specifically have high digital skills themselves. They're really for teachers who are interested to use them from all levels of digital skills or subjects that they're teaching. So they're really uh, uh, transversal in that sense. This chapter also looks into different barriers and challenges that you might face in the process and how you can address them. Moreover, a few ways forward, as we call them, different chapters look into how uh, uh, different activities you can do in the classroom. You can ask your students to reflect on the positive use of digital technologies, creation of communities, social movements. You can encourage them to find accurate online information and then differentiate it with uh, such that is not accurate, to reflect on their well-being, how they should be responsible citizens online. And at the end of the day, you as educators are not expected to know everything. I think this is very clear. The next chapter looks into maybe one of the main topics of discussions, definitely disinformation, and it's a very important chapter that looks into, that supports you in identifying how disinformation is defined, the different characteristics, narratives such as us versus them, simplifying facts, repeating ideas all over again, why disinformation is created, what is the responsibility of the different actors when we talk about media, governments, when we talk about also the different dimensions of this information, we have the technical, the ethical, the economic one. And at the end of the day, this chapter also supports you in supporting your learners in assessing the credibility of different information. So different examples and activities here include exploring critical thinking, fact checking, introducing debunking, pre-bunking and also really encouraging your students to research and to discuss why this information is created. You can 
it's always a good practice to ask them to reflect on topics that are relevant and important for them, such as climate change, the pandemic more recently. So really to contextualize the discussions on this information on relevant topics. And last chapter, but a very important one, it's about assessing digital literacy and evaluating initiatives taken at schools level. So this chapter is very helpful in, in helping you as teachers to identify the different abilities that include that imply being digitally literate, such as separating facts from opinions, identifying manipulative strategies, fact checking, finding, using, creating, uh, disseminating information and using digital devices effectively. You have a few ideas of assessment practices to be used, such as self-evaluation, open questions, um, reflections on outcomes. Uh, you, For instance, you can suggest to your students to develop narratives and counter narratives and then compare them. And then lastly, this chapter, as I said, looks into the evaluation. So for you to reflect on how this, uh, these initiatives have been implemented, what has been achieved. And here we have a number of useful um, tools at European level, such as the selfie self reflection tool for schools, which looks more broadly in the use of digital technologies and skills development in the premises of the school. Last uh, slide from me is to really highlight that these guidelines are, have been developed with the objective to be as practical and as hands-on as possible. And you will hear from Kari later on, but I would really like to highlight that apart from the different considerations, the different uh, elements uh, uh, that I highlighted, they include a number of practical tips, activity plans that you can use directly in your classes, regardless of the subject. Uh, they include a number of cautionary notes on topics that, for instance, you need to pay a bit closer attention to related to, let's say, conspiracy theories or more emotional elements of this information. And they include also a number of insights on topics that you would find useful and relevant. Lastly, I would like to finish by saying that these guidelines are translated in all EU official languages, so they are available in 24 languages at, at the moment. So um, you can really use them right away in the classroom in your own language. They are complemented by a whole communication package, a fact sheet and an infographic, but also a short video. And the video is again subtitled in all these 24 languages and you can uh, check it out yourself. Everything is available on the QR code you have here. And of course, uh, I am sure you will either receive these slides or I can put the links also in the chat for you to check out the guidelines directly. So this is all on my side. I would really like to thank you for, for your attention. And uh, I think now it's the time to give the floor to Tukari who would really go into the more practical element and and to really some concrete activities from the guidelines. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Simona, for your presentation. Uh, we had some questions, but uh, we will address them uh, at the end. And now is the time indeed to leave the floor to our second speaker, Kari. Please, the floor is yours, the virtual floor, actually. So here we go. Good afternoon to everybody. And thanks, Simona, for a brilliant presentation. Uh, I will continue from here. So I have a background as a teacher and a headmaster, and I've been uh, working uh, over four years in Finland in my school with uh, media literacy, testing all kinds of things. So I will speak partly as a member of expert group, but also partly as a, a person who have been uh, hands on doing this uh, with real children and real teachers. So, like uh, Simona described, we had a very hectic year. I mean, we were the digital slaves of the Commission doing a lot of uh, research, a lot of uh, reading, a lot of discussion, and we produced a final report. Um, it's a little bit heavy. Oh, it's about 100 pages, but it has a lot of content. So, if you feel to dig a little bit deeper than the guidelines, uh, please check the expert group report because you can find a lot of links to the national practices, to the uh, good examples, uh, research results which are effective and so on. So I warmly recommend you to 
not to read it from uh, first place to page to last page, but have a look. And we made these guidelines for teachers where we kind of pick the, the berries and the strawberries from the report, uh, targeted to the teachers. And the good news is that according to all the research we did together with our uh, expert com colleagues, disinformation can be tackled, digital literacy can be teached and learned. The tech can be used critically and responsibly, and it is possible to assess these competencies. This is all possible. And we try to provide some kind of practical information in the guidelines. So uh, this is the official uh, division of the information disorders, and it might sound a little bit strange, so a few words. Uh, we have been testing in Finland this with the primary children. And the misinformation is easy to understand. We all make mistakes. Uh, we pass information without bad intentions to somebody, and afterwards we correct it. Teachers make mistakes, magazines make mistakes, journalists make mistakes, politicians make mistakes, and it's, it can be corrected and, and it's not um, meant no harm. So it's just that. Disinformation is a lie. It's a wrong information which is uh, created, presented and disseminated in knowingly that it's a lie and it's uh, there is often an economical gain, the gain to uh, have more clicks on the certain sites, but there might be political or other reasons behind uh, to spread this information and it's causing public harm. Malinformation is a little bit less known, but uh, the, the children in the primary noticed it straight away. It's kind of gossip or information which is spread about person who doesn't want that information to be spread. And it might be correct, but the, it's spread in order to make harm to that person or the organization. So this concept can be learned and taught from primary on uh, onwards. When we are dis discussing these issues and the use of social media with children and students, uh, it is important for the teachers to listen to the students, um, to have a contact point with them. Because um, I have experienced myself, I go in front of the classroom of the secondary school students, and I ask them that uh, what kind of social media do they use, and nobody says anything because they think that it's their thing and the teachers should not be mixed up with that. So it's important to create this kind of uh, safe uh, uh, atmosphere, to create some kind of trust. And in, in order to open the discussion, sometimes uh, anonymous uh, questions are needed. For example, a survey like Slido, that uh, what, what is the most popular platform you are using? How many hours you spend time with the online environment? And also that um, to discuss issues like here. Uh, but it's important that the, there is a connection that the children and the students know that uh, the teachers are not trying to dictate something, but there is a common approach that we would like to discuss these serious issues. Because most of the children uh, who are using uh, mobile uh, devices have been uh, victims uh, of certain types of problems. Uh, in a very recent Finnish study, 92% uh, of the Finnish youngsters uh, declared that they have had different types of problems with the uh, online environments. Um, so this type of approach to start the discussion, open the, uh, the door would be good. Uh, also, many students are afraid of cybercrime, phishing, things that uh, something is happening, somebody is stealing their identity, somebody is uh, doing uh, bad jokes with them, e-commerce, a lot of uh, um, students are ordering things, they are afraid of giving their credit card information or parents' credit card information to the sites. These are good moments uh, to start talking about this, to talk about algorithms, to why do I get these results uh, on the Google search, uh, and why my results are different than uh, all the other ones in the class, it's a good starting point. Especially during the COVID times, in many schools there were uh, problems with the parents. Um, 
of course, it was distance teaching, but also parents with very strong views, for example, about vaccination or something else, created uh, in some uh, areas uh, uh, problems. So it's better to inform parents in the first place that now we are going to speak in the next coming uh, sessions uh, about um, online uh, behavior or digital uh, disinformation so that they are informed. And if there is any resistance, it's better that the school management is informed so that you are not all alone uh, and all the parents or, or some parents or some very difficult parents are against you. And consider to discuss it with the school management, with your colleagues, and also if you have this kind of social workers available uh, and to, to organize something to, together with them so that you are not left alone. Um, in the European School Net, there is this MOOC. Uh, I have been involved in developing it. Uh, it was launched last year this time, and it's um, targeted to the uh, teachers who would like to start a whole school project uh, about uh, tackling disinformation. And it's still it's free. It's absolutely brilliant. And uh, even though I have been a little bit involved with it, but it's something I can warmly recommend. And it's on the uh, European School Net Academy, and it's free to use. Then there are these um, cognitive and emotional mechanisms that can prevent young people to accept evidence. So we, all the teachers know that the, 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 the pupils, especially in certain age, they want to be, uh, they're behaving in a group. They don't want to be different than other ones. And that creates a several kind of um, uh, a cognitive and emotional mechanism which are preventing um, access to them. Uh, there is also very human to have a confirmation bias. We, uh, we uh, kind of look for information which is confirming the information we have uh, already with us. And we are kind of ignoring the information uh, which is not matching our own views. There is also, and all the parents know this, that this false consensus when a teenager says that every other child, every other uh, young person in my class have this and that, there is this idea that false consensus effect that people tend to overestimate how many others share their views. And so on. I don't want to go further on this you can read more. Um, in the guidelines, uh, there is a lot of digital literacy learning objectives. And it's not idea that everybody is doing everything, but maybe you can have a look and pick up uh, the learning objectives which are matching to your curricula, your level, to your subject. And there are a different department for primary and different department for secondary. And I'm sure that you can find um, uh, this kind of learning outcomes from which you can start uh, doing your lessons without going out from your curriculum. So the disinformation, it comes uh, in the social media by all means. And first of all, the amount of information in the uh, cloud internet is increasing incredibly every day. And I would say that there is also a lot of junk information, which is not good for anything. So the real talent, uh, the real skill is to pick up from all the information, for example, the search engines are providing you the one which is matching your uh, needs, information needs. When you get uh, disinformation claims, uh, they are often quite emotional, shocking, because people don't act normally when they are kind of uh, in the uh, certain shock. Um, they are very uh, dividing. They are kind of us against everybody else, um, forcing you to take a position. And this is not really the case in the real life. They are too simplified. There is um, presented only a little part of the, there is little part of fact, and then the conclusions are completely uh, irrational. 
And more and more, there are this kind of visual disinformation, uh, manipulated images, uh, images which are linked to the wrong text, a wrong um, title, which gives a totally other view on that. And this is something which is um, quite interesting with the students to do, to check the origin and the authenticity of the, uh, the pictures and uh, the videos. There are good tools for that nowadays, and there are some kind of hints in the uh, in the program. There is a lot of things. I've been working with the Finnish fact checking organization called Faktabari for the last seven years, and um, as an educator, uh, we have been trying to translate the methods used by fact checkers to the school environment for the students and the teachers. And for example, these image and video verification tools used by fact checkers can be easily used by anybody. And uh, uh, in every country, there is a fact checking organization. And for example, and this is an unbelievable uh, database of uh, verified fact checks uh, with uh, over 40 languages, over 100 countries, 17,000 um, fact checks. And it's worth checking. If you want to find uh, the fact checking organization in your region, in your country, in your language, you can uh, uh, you can choose them here, even though you would not be looking for uh, COVID related uh, fact checks. In the beginning, let's say six, five years ago, we had a long list of um, rules so that if you are having a claim, online claim, do this, 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 this and this. We have noticed that people are not able to remember many, uh, many check levels. And this is kind of uh, traffic uh, um, instructions in the online uh, highways. I mean, you notice uh, before going on the other side of the road, look left, look right, look left. This is the same kind of instruction. First, check who is behind it. Do you find an author? Do you, is it done by a journalist, a, a, a respectable organization, magazine, or is there no source? If, if you don't find the source, skip it. Uh, what is the evidence based, which is used to base the claim? If you don't find the evidence, skip it. And check what other sources have to say. And if you don't find the information any elsewhere, probably it's disinformation. So these three things, uh, are the key. Then one has to remember that online and offline environments are very different. If you go to the library, there are books which are um, which have gone a lot of gatekeeping projects. First of all, they have been written, they have been edited, there has been a publisher, uh, they have been uh, put in the market, they have been bought in the library. So there are many levels of gatekeeping. In the online environments, whomsoever uh, can spread whatsoever information as much as possible quickly. Information can be changed, removed and add all the time. So one needs a little bit different ways of reading and analyzing the online information than in the, um, for example, the, the printed information. And the on online environments, the platforms are uh, maximizing their commercial interest. They are the biggest companies on the earth at this moment, selling our data uh, for advertisers. They are trying to capture our uh, attention. Uh, if you are in YouTube and you forgot to, to stop after your video, you will get a new one, a new one, a new one. And the algorithms know what you like, and you will keep on going. And after two hours, you realize that you have spent two times of watching nonsense videos. And they are using our data uh, to make the uh, earnings. And what is the most important information for them is what we are planning to do in the near future. So, for example, if I'm looking to travel tickets to, uh, to for example, Paris, uh, in Google or other platform, I will start to get advertisements because what we are doing next is the most uh, valuable information for advertisers. Tools for teachers. So there are a lot of um, effective methods uh, to tackle disinformation presented in these um, guidelines. 
uh, debunking, which is actually what fact checkers do. They verify the, the claim and then they are informing the, that what is correct or what is not correct. Um, there is more and more this kind of uh, pedagogical fact checks where fact checkers are showing how they are verifying the information so that people would learn it. So check the fact checking pages to, to find it. Prebunking is maybe the most, um, according to studies, it's the most effective way of uh, preventing, uh, uh, as a preventing measure against disinformation. So public is made um, aware beforehand that in the next coming weeks, there's going to be, for example, um, information coming from, disinformation coming from certain sources for this and this reason, and using this and these methods. And when the people see it, Finally, they are kind of feeling, oh, uh, this is something I've been warned. I don't touch it. And this works, for example, in phishing. And I mean, when somebody is trying to steal, for example, your credit card information. In Finland, um, a lot of banks, for example, send warnings to their clients that please be careful that now in the next days, there, there might be these kind of phishing messages you get. Don't open them. And it seems to be working. Lateral reading is something um, I would need a little bit more time to explain, but there is a wonderful lesson of Stanford University Civic Online Reasoning, which are free to use, which are explaining it more. And it's based on these three questions. So when you are having any internet search, you get the thousand, two thousand, five million hits. Most probably the first ones are sponsored. I mean, Companies have been buying or organizations have been buying in order to have a visibility. Then there might be uh, technically pushed uh, information. And in order to find what you are really looking for, you should really not open it all, but uh, check who is behind the information, what is the evidence and what other sources say. And if something is not correct, skip it. And that's... Um, that's called uh, strategic ignorance. Sometimes it's good to invite to the classroom an external expert. For example, a journalist who is telling that how they are verifying the information before publishing, telling that there is ethics of journalism, telling that if there is a kind of um, false evidence that how the newspapers and the magazines are correcting the uh, mistakes, etc. Also, the fact checkers, uh, NGOs, academic uh, researchers are often happy to come to school to give information and support you. One of the most uh, uh, amazing things I have witnessed was that we invited a lawyer to, to, to speak about the online environment. And students had so many questions on, on linked to that they are thinking of. What happens if somebody is stealing my identity? Is it a crime? What happens if I do this and that? What happens if I download something uh, illegally? What is the consequence of doing this and that? So if you are using external experts in your class, it's well seen. There are certain things you have to might consider, and you can see it uh, here on the right side. Um, as I told, I've been working with the Finnish fact-checking organization called Faktabari. We have published last autumn our digital information literacy guide. And if you want to have more information of anything what I have said so far, we have these uh, 16 articles going deeper in each area on. And it's free to, to use and free to download. In Europe, there are a lot of organizations, and I just mentioned some. Lie detectors is working in many countries. There are journalists coming to class telling about uh, uh, how to how to analyze online information. The European Digital Media Observatory has um, nowadays um, uh, over 10 hubs. For example, Aktabari in Finland is in the Nordic hub, which are producing materials uh, for to uh, to for the awareness and it's in interesting to see what they do. European Schoolnet has a, a quite good collection of uh, online tools uh, which can be used for free. Um, one of the 
EDMO uh, hubs, it's the Central European uh, EDMO, uh, which have created these animated uh, tools uh, for uh, teachers or anyone to, to learn a little bit, for example, reverse video search or reverse image search, etc. Or if you want to play Bellingcat, uh, geolocation uh, inst instruction using metadata of, uh, of different information, it's very nice materials. And there is this new learning corner in the European uh, Union, which is providing also materials. And here we have uh, uh, this spot and fact dissipation, uh, a ready-made presentation uh, slides, where it, it, they are quite a lot, but you can maybe pick the ones you would like to use in the classroom, so you don't have to do everything from the scratch. And I'm working in the European Union Intellectual Property Office, and together with the, all the uh, 27 ministries of education and culture, we have created this database because teachers and students are also the users of digital content. Um, and very often teachers are, for example, creating content. And for example, can teachers use streaming of um, Netflix in the class? Uh, can teachers share his or her Spotify in the classroom situation? We have answers country by country in all the EU languages in this database. It's uh, the, the questions we have received from teachers all over to Europe, and it's quite interesting to read and also see what happens in other countries. So, conclusion. Uh, I hope that you can get inspired to, to learn and teach digital literacy. Um, learn it for, first yourself, teach it with your class, and use it in the, your everyday life. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. I, I hope you can hear me. Yes. OK, great. So thank you very much for your presentation. And I'll bring back also Simona on the screen because and maybe also myself. <laughs> uh, because we have some some questions, so uh, I would like to invite the participant to continue to type their questions, but also if you have comments, thoughts, please feel free to share them in the chat and we will read out loud them for you. Uh, so I think we can move to the first question uh, that is actually for Simona. And the question is, when approaching media literacy guidelines for the first time, what would be the most effective approach for a teacher in, in your opinion? It is advisable to begin with the theoretical aspects before moving on the practical applications. Thanks a lot for this question. Uh, well, I think the guidelines we have uh, put forward uh, and the expert group has developed have a very good balance between theory and practice. So my suggestion would be actually for a teacher to go through the guidelines first to see the different elements they include and how they can be best applied in the classroom. I have to say the guidelines, in my opinion, don't are not particularly heavy on the theory, they have just enough theory to, to, to start the conversation, to understand the main concepts, but they really focus a lot on the practice, on the practical element of the development of the skills and competences. So it's a mix of both without necessarily putting far too much emphasis on the theoretical aspect, but without it, without, without knowing the difference between disinformation, misinformation, malinformation, why is it created, how is it created, it's very difficult also to do the actual uh, practical activity. So I think the balance between the two should be sought with, of course, uh, making it as practical and hands-on as possible. Thank you very much, Simona, for replying to the to the question. And I think we have now one question for uh, for Kari. And the question is, do you believe is uh, um, more effective uh, to have a separate course dedicated to media literacy uh, and tackling this information only? Or should these topics be integrated into all subjects as a transversal subject, let's say? So uh, I'm a big fan of the Finnish uh, school system and the Finnish uh, curricula, where the, we call it multiliteracy uh, is a kind of transversal um, subject. But it's well defined on, on each subject, what 
each subject teacher in which level should do. So it's not left in the kind of um, open, but it's a. Uh, I take an example. I worked uh, with a group of science experts, uh, science teachers last year. We published uh, science education in the age of misinformation. And um, we noticed that uh, science teachers are not very often um, talking about this information. And yet, in the practice, a lot of, for example, the COVID period uh, disinformation was linked to the scientific basis. So our, our outcome was that uh, it's the, um, the disinformation, media literacy skills should not be only left to the mother tongue teacher or the teacher of the social science. It should concern also the science teachers. It should concern actually all the teachers and all the subjects in all the levels. And, and the teacher, for example, in science, who can uh, explain better to the, the students that if you see this type of a pseudoscientific claim, don't uh, believe it. And how to detect a pseudoscientific claims, it's difficult for the mother tongue teacher to explain it. So in my view, that the kind of transversal competence is better. Yet there is some recent uh, studies made, uh, especially in Stanford University, that even a six lesson input for the secondary students can give tools for young people to, to deal with disinformation better. So, so this is the two different aspects. In the expert group, about half of the experts were on the opinion that it should be also a separate subject. Thank you very much, Kari. I think it was really clear. And thank you also for always bringing the concrete and the examples in. I think it's really useful for our teachers. And actually, we have another question uh, for you. And of course, Simona, if you feel, feel free to add whenever you want to add something, uh, feel free to interrupt me and take the floor. So the question is, uh, how can educators effectively teach media literacy in classrooms, considering that while it might be beneficial, challenge, um, and well, the, I will rephrase a bit the question. So uh, while it's feasible and it's possible, even though it's a challenge to teach media literacy in the classroom, then might be difficult for the students once they go out outside in the real world to apply what they learn in classroom, because the real world, of course, it's more difficult, it's full of challenges, and maybe they don't have all the necessary tools once they are outside to uh, put into practice what they learn in the classrooms. And um, are these guidelines also made uh, for this to be able to give the students the necessary tools they need to uh, address the real world, let's say? So maybe I'm answering to this. Um, there is not a simple answer for this. Um, once you learn something in the school, let's take this river, reverse image search. Uh, we have evidence that uh, students are using it straight away when they go home uh, at their everyday life, um, but they are using it differently. Um, just to give a stereotypic uh, example is that uh, uh, the boys are checking from the pictures if there is uh, artificially photoshopped muscles or girls are looking at other things. And this is not what we thought. We, we had other, other reasons to teach it, but I mean, they are using the tools we are giving them. Um, I've never met a young person who is uh, saying that I really like uh, spreading lies. It's, it's not cool. Uh, if somebody is spreading information which is not verified, um, Let's take sport worlds. There are always uh, stories about the uh, footballers who are uh, doing this and that. And if somebody who is football fan is spreading a, a claim which is not true, it's shameful. So there is a motivation for young people to learn uh, to verify the facts before sharing. And uh, it's a long process, but it, it, it works. Yeah. 
Yeah, I understand it was a complicated question, not easy to answer at all. So thank you very <laughs> much <laughs> for, for trying. Okay, uh, I think we are um, we are moving towards the end. Uh, but before closing, I would like really to thank all the people who joined to do, uh, today and who posted the question and the comment who participated in the quiz at the beginning. It was really nice to interact with you. And of course, I would like uh, to thank Simona for being here with us presenting the guidelines and also Kari for giving us some uh, good practical examples that I'm sure will be very, very useful for uh, the teachers who participated today. Uh, before uh, I give you maybe the last, uh, the floor again to you for the for a final word, a final suggestion, advice for our teachers, I would like to remind you all that the recording will be available, uh, so you will be able to catch up if you miss some part of the webinar. So, uh, Simona, Kari, thank you very much. If you want to say something before we close, please, the floor is yours. You are very welcome. I would thank you so much, Marta. First of all, thanks a lot for the invitation and really big thanks to everybody who joined us this afternoon for this session. Um, we really hope it was useful, but moreover, we hope that the guidelines will be useful for you. I, I, I'm really strong believer that they are very good deliverable. What would make them an excellent deliverable is to be used in the classrooms and to be to see how they are used in different ways, in different subjects with the, uh, and for you to tell us your own experience. So thanks again and looking forward to hearing from you after you have used them. Thank you. Um, from my part, I would encourage everybody to, to just uh, start discussing with your children, with your students in the classroom about uh, social media. Uh, it might be difficult in the beginning, but you will notice that it's um, it's something which is needed. Students are left too much alone with their devices. There is a lot of research which shows that um, even though students seem to be absolutely degenerative, they can use the devices, the applications, they can create videos and they can do a lot of things, play games. But when they are asked to analyze the information or the content, they are a little bit lost and they need tools for that. And th as teachers, it's our duty to pass it to them. Brilliant. Thank you very much again, Simona. Thank you very much again, Kari. And thank you uh, to all the participants today. Uh, I wish you all a good evening. Uh, stay safe and stay in touch. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.